In this episode of Physics Twist, finding Sophie, the robot fish, a brand new human organ with a very strange name, creating water out of thin air, and my personal favourite, space lasers. Again, I am your host, Duncan Bell, as Holly is still on leave, or she's just kind of away. Uh, I'm joined by Steph, who is a science education officer here at Physics Education. Now, Steph, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. And can you please tell us what you do here, and what you've done previously that might have brought you here, and what makes you tick? Um, Well, I am a science education officer, like you said, so I present programs, workshops, shows... Um, school vacation days, uh, birthday parties, everything that physics does, Mm -hmm. I do a little bit of. Um, I only came here in January, so I'm still pretty new to the company. Like me. Like you. Uh, But I am really enjoying it. Uh, It's a big change for me. So I come from a research science background. I did a, um, an honors degree in, uh, biology, and then I moved to the Netherlands and I did a PhD in cell and molecular biology. So I've done wow. a lot of work with cells, yeast, bacteria, um, also a lot of work with proteins. Um, and I finished my PhD and I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> um, enough of that. Yeah. Uh, teaching is a really big part of, of uh, doing a PhD. And so I decided to use those skills. Oh, um, yes. I looked for a cool science teaching job and I found physics. So you found it? I did. I did find my teaching job. teaching job, yes. Very nice. So you are actually a doctor. I am a doctor. Oh, wow. I am a doctor of philosophy, and I have a very nice certificate that is in Latin. Is it really? Yes, it is. From which Latin. university did you say? From the University of Chronium, which is in the north of the Netherlands. <laughs> I'm not going to try and repeat that name. <laughs> That's all right. I'm out of practice, too. I haven't lived there for a while, yeah, so right. I'm probably doing it terribly as well. Doctor of philosophy. Very <laughs> impressive doctor of philosophy, Steph. Cool. So um, I asked you to bring in a couple of science and or technology stories from the Mm -hmm. past week and maybe a bit more. Um, And can you please introduce us to the first one that you'd like to talk about? Okay. Well, my first one is the wiggliest science story from the past week. It is about a... my interest, yes. It's about a robotic fish. So the robotic fish, her name is Sophie. Really? Yes. Okay. Uh, She moves just like a fish, apparently. Amazing. If you go online and you look up Sophie, Mm S-O-F-I, you can find some video of her, of what it looks like through her eyes as she swims around through the coral, and what she looks like as she swims as well. Um, And I really like this story because we get, we hear a lot of talk about robots, and we see robots either looking like really creepy and like people, Mm, or we see them- Valley. Yes. Yeah. Or we see them looking um, maybe like, uh, like they're in some sort of robot wars, big machines trying to kill each other. Um, and this was just an example of a different type of robotic application. So apparently it's called soft robotics. Soft robotics is when you use soft materials oh, okay. on the so, outside of your robot. So just rubbers, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, okay, cool. she's, got, she's made of silicon. Apparently she started as a silicon tail mm-hmm. in a tank. Right. Um, and now she looks almost like a fish and she swims underwater. Um, and the idea behind Sophie was to uh, investigate um, ocean environments without disturbing Right, fish, okay, right. so sort of like an unmanned aerial drone, but for the ocean. Exactly. Okay, yeah. awesome. And one that doesn't, um, apparently doesn't bother the other fish. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's not loud, she works with a hydraulic pump, I think, so... How would we know if they did bother the fish, though? Yeah, like that's hard, right? If the fish have their right? own uncanny valley. That's hard, right? Um, I don't know if fish have their own uncanny valley. Mm. Oh, just, we might just interject there to explain what the uncanny valley is to those people who haven't heard of it kind of the phenomenon where you look at a sort of humanoid robot, especially the more advanced ones, and they look quite human, but there's something off about it. Yeah, so it only it makes works, them quite creepy. It only works if it's a really well-designed robot. Like, it only mm. works if it's really close to being human, but not. Yeah, exactly. So what was that movie with um, Robin Williams in? It was like Centennial Man or something like that. It's kind of yes. like something yeah. like that, yeah. Kind of like that, where you go, oh, it's so close, but it's not quite human, and it's it's eerie and um, not very nice to look at or interact with. So that I think a lot of robot sort of manufacturers are trying to bridge that gap, that uncanny valley now. Anyway, yeah. do go on. Um, all right, so the other thing that was interesting I, that made me laugh when I read this um, 
and we were discussing this before how in even in the most advanced science labs you get things that have been sort of cobbled together from whatever works mm -hmm. right um there's a lot of hair dryers and microwaves in Really? Science labs, yeah, because you need them to do things. Like, yeah, if okay. you want hot air, a hair dryer is the, yeah. it's the easiest way to get it. So you can finish your experiment and then do your two-minute noodles. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, they, they all have really big, big, bright stickers on them about not putting food oh, in the really? microwaves. Yes. Oh, the dream is dead. <laughs> um, so what made me laugh when I read this story is that um, Sophie is controlled by a souped-up Nintendo controller. Amazing. And souped-up is a quote from the article. From the article. Yes. <laughs> Who, uh, where did this article come from? The New York Times. The New York <laughs> Times. Um, they have some really good stories there. I quite like reading yeah. their, um, their science and tech sections. Friends of the podcast, New York Friends Times. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, it uses a Nintendo controller. Um, and she's controlled by sound waves. Because the signals that you use to control like aerial drones, like you mentioned, they don't work underwater. They don't yeah, of course. So, she's controlled by bursts of sound that they have sort of coded. They've, they've made a little language that their Nintendo controller talks to Sophie with to tell her what to do with different Fantastic. sounds. Yeah. Um, so the bit of research that comes next, apparently, um, or one of them, is checking to see whether dolphins and whales can hear her and whether they're mm. bothered by her. Okay. Fish, apparently not. <clears throat> Fish, not so much okay. with the hearing. Yep. Um, of course, dolphins and whales, which are mammals, yep. not fish, um, may be bothered by... Yeah, controls. I'm just remembering that scene from Finding Nemo. I guess they'll have to come out with a Finding Sophie now. But the mm -hmm. scene from Finding Nemo where they're trapped in the fish tank and that girl with the braces comes up and starts tapping on the glass. Yes. Yes, it's kind of kind of like that. I'm imagining they're just going to be <laughs> ah! freaked out. Yeah. So that would mean that if the fish aren't disturbed, then the sound waves that they're using to control Sophie are not within the sort of audible range. For yeah, fish. I think um, for fish, yeah, they yes. That okay. would be that would be my guess. That's the hypothesis. That's the hypothesis. Okay. Yes. And do we know? Well, I guess that's what they're going to find out: whether or not those sound waves are going to be in the audible range for dolphins and whales as well. That's yeah. the idea. Okay. Or something that they're bothered by. It depends, as, as also on how much those sound waves travel. Mm -hmm. um, but just a shout out because I'm not sure if I mentioned the details. Um, this was a team from MIT. Right, okay. That's where they've developed Sophie, so the Massachusetts nice Institute of Technology. Okay. And what do you say they're actually going to use this for? So the Precisely? idea is that it becomes a tool for biologists mm -hmm. to observe um, those environments, um, just like having a drone that you can run <clears> around <throat> and look at stuff. But again, a drone that is cheaper yep. and less intrusive for the wildlife. So it'll have some sort of camera on there. Yeah, you can, like, like I said, if you go look online, you can see what it looks like through Sophie's eyes. It's pretty yeah. funny because she because she wiggles through the water. Oh, so it's but back it's, and forth. It's a, bit, it's a bit like, yeah, it's a bit uh, sickening, actually, really? <laughs> the footage because it swings back and forth. Oh, we'll have to put that in the show notes when I put this up. And yeah, Finding Sophie, the movie Pixar, get on it. Okay, so um, something that I wanted to talk about this week is a... Huge discovery in the world of anatomy. And, um, Steph, can you do me a favour? Yes. And just quickly, just give me a quick punch in my, in my tummy here. <laughs> <laughs> Great sound effects. Yep, yeah, cool. So, ah, my interstitium. You got me right in my interstitium. <laughs> Great gag. You're probably thinking, what is your interstitium? The answer is, it is a new organ that's been discovered in the human body that no one knew was there before. It's kind of under debate, I guess you could say. So, scientists from the... Well, it's a guy called Neil Thies. I'm um, not exactly sure where he's from. But um, basically found that there is a, a series of sort of connective tissues surrounding other organs um, called the interstitium. And they had never actually come across this before. Because when investigating the inside of the human body, they do something called histology. And histology basically refers to cutting cross sections of tissue and then looking at them under a microscope. But when you do that, this interstitium would disappear. The reason for that is because the interstitium is this connective tissue made out of something called collagen. Collagen you can find in your skin, for example. Um, and it was filled with fluid. And when you do a cross-section of some tissue, that fluid is just going to drain out 
and disappear. So no one had actually ever seen this before. So this um, this guy Neil Thies had discovered it because he was doing a um, uh, what's the word for it? Help me out with this, Steph. He was do- an oscopy of some yes, sort. some sort of endoscopy. Yes, yes, and okay. then he was doing an endoscopy and came across this sort of thick connective tissue and then went. What on earth is that? Never seen that before. Checked some anatomy charts and it wasn't on there. So he's thinking, we found something new. And um, yeah, so has actually confirmed that this is a sort of a new anatomical part that's never been seen before because all of the research that we've done into human anatomy has been done with, you know, tissue that's been removed Mm-hmm. And never in a living specimen, or not? I shouldn't say never, but far less frequently in a in a living yeah. well, specimen. Well, you're not going to stop and have a look around while you're doing your surgery. <clears throat> yeah, you just want to get it done. You just, yeah, you just safety first, really. Exactly. Yeah. So um, the idea um, that they've had that like uh, around the function of this um, interstitium is that this is a connective tissue that is in between the organs. Mm-hmm. Like I said, is filled with a fluid, and the fluid is effectively meant to protect organs okay it's sort of gives them some breathing room i guess you could say so if um you know through the rough and tumble of everyday life things kind of move around and that is actually some sort of protective tissue for those organs themselves so, I, so you would be happy that i punched you <clears throat> in your interstitium and not say directly in your kidneys exactly yeah i need those specifically <laughs> i need those um so the interstitium is there to protect those those other crucial organs like your kidneys or your lungs or your heart or something like that. So yeah, a brand new, brand new organ. And this guy, uh, Neil Theus, he's said that he thinks it should be classified as a proper, proper organ because of its, what he calls unique properties and structure, which are, and I quote, highly specific and dependent on the unique structures and cell types that form it. Meaning effectively that it is distinct from everything that it is surrounding. So. Yeah, so I'm not actually <clears throat> sure exactly what the definition of an organ is. It's one of those things that, you know, we've given a name. Mm. We've made up a name yeah. for things to say that it's an organ. I know that the skin is an organ, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure what the definition of an organ I, is. I think it would have to be yeah something that is in some way distinct from, um, oh, what's a good way to say it? it? It's something that performs a very specific function. Yeah. I think we can yeah. agree on that. Skin's got a function. Skin has a very specific function. And like, like Neil Theus has said here, it's highly specific and dependent on the structures and cell types that form it. So skin has a very specific function and it's made of a certain specific material or materials, um, which makes it distinct from other parts of the body. And so he's basically thinking this interstitium is distinct in the cells that form it and it has a distinct function, different mm-hmm. from everything else. Therefore, it should be classified as an organ. Quite frankly, I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> Fair enough. So the other thing that was interesting about that story, I thought, is um, they talked about the fact that the interstitium may be a way, another way that uh, substances can travel around your body. Mm. And, of course, they specifically mentioned cancer because mm-hmm. if you can talk about cancer while you're doing your research... Yep. Uh, you get more money and people want to write stories about it. Oh, is that why they've done it? Yes. Very clever. Yes. So, uh, so they were saying that, you know, if a cancer cell can get into this, this fluid in the interstitium, it could travel somewhere else. Mm, mm. And um, through the lymph nodes, for example. Yeah. Yep. But depending on what the fluid is and where the fluid comes from, um, other things might travel in there as well. Mm. Blood, um, for example, could escape into that. Uh, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Well, um, <laughs> you haven't been here for the previous episodes, but um, we've discovered that the sort of motto of the podcast is, it remains to be seen. It remains so, <laughs> to be seen. <laughs> I think yes. you can apply that yes. to this story as well. All right. So the other thing that I saw that I really liked um, is a story about um, using, you know, those little, those little silica packets that you get in like food and stuff, Mm -hmm. prepackaged food or like in your shoes, they come in shoe boxes. Um, and the job of those is to absorb any water that might be Mm. hanging around. The ones that you do not eat. You do not eat. Yes. There's very big letters, letters do not eat. Um, they absorb water. It's a special type of chemical called a desiccant. It absorbs Mm. water. Um, Dr. Steph. Yes. (laughs) And, uh, there's a group of scientists that are using, although I actually couldn't tell from the story, they were specifically using silica or if they had just said it's like silica. Mm, okay. Silica-esque. Silica-esque. Yes. They're using um, a desiccant to uh, make water come out of thin air or thick air or wet air <laughs> as the case may be. 
wet air. Yes. So there is a um, a prize. So a big competition run mm-hmm. by a group called X Prize. X P R I Z E. Interesting to look up because they have a lot of different um, competitions that they run. Mm-hmm. They're running a specific one called the Water Abundance X Prize, and the rules are that you need to create a device that extracts a minimum of 2,000 litres of water per day from wow, the atmosphere. Wow, that's a lot. Yes, using 100% renewable energy uh-huh. at a cost of no more than two cents per litre. Good Lord. Yes, so they're really setting high yeah. high standards for this this competition. Um, and, and there's an Australian group that are in the finalists, so it's down went from 96 teams to five. Mm-hmm. One of the teams uh, in the finalists is uh, from Newcastle Uni, they're a team run by Professor Mogda Terry, who's a chemical engineer who's developed a bunch of other cool things. Mm-hmm. So um, apparently his favorite demo is in one of his lectures, he uses his heat, the heat from a coffee cup to run a fan. So like mm. he walks in with his coffee and he puts his coffee underneath the machine he developed. Yeah. And just the heat coming out from the coffee is enough to run yeah. a fan. Awesome. It's actually a thing called a heat engine. Yeah. Specifically. And we, well... Hmm. There's a little sales pitch for physics. Uh, we, can, we can actually bring those along, I think. We've actually got some here. Mm. Um, and you can place it on the palm of your hand, and the heat from your hand will make this engine run. Yeah, really so um, Professor Monk Terry has it's developed... A bigger version of that. Yeah, mm. a bunch of... Well, of course, if you're going to do them commercially as well, they need to be super efficient. Mm. So he works on making those kinds of ideas super efficient and commercially viable, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, which sounds like it's about making money, but it's more like... Some, you know, someone told me this once. If you if you want to revolutionize the revenu- <sighs> if you want to revolutionize the world in terms of making things greener mm-hmm. and more friendly to the environment, figure out a way to do it that saves people money. Absolutely, and they will do it. Yeah. So course. make it commercially viable, and it will get used. Yep. And so this guy's probably not doing it for his own commercial benefit, but. Well, I'm sure he doesn't say no to the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, the, the idea X-Pots. is. <laughs> Um, yeah, the idea is to make these huge cha- huge changes to the world. So mm. um, they're, the team from Newcastle, their system, they absorb water at night using a desiccant, mm-hmm. something like those silica packets. Um, then during the day, solar energy is used to produce hot, humid air from, the, from that absorbed mm-hmm. water. Yep. And then, and I'm guessing the next night when it gets cold again, that hot air condenses oh. and you get water back out. Brilliant. So you absorb water from a really big area. Wish I had thought of that. Mm, yes. Well. <laughs> um, so I like this story. I mean, I, I always like these kind of cool innovations. Yeah. Um, I like things being used for for a different purpose. These do not eat silica packets, you know. Um, but it I doesn't really... say do not drink. <laughs> so. <laughs> do not drink. That's true. If it gets wet enough, <laughs> yeah, so it's fine. fine. Uh, that's not true, kids. Don't try that. Yeah, yeah don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Disclaimer. But I also like these really big competitions. So um, X Prize describe themselves as this is a quote from their website: an innovation engine, a facilitator of exponential change, a catalyst for the benefit of humanity. Wow. Mm. Sounds like it's like the X Games for science. Yeah, but the idea is that they think that if you can can incentivize research, you know, you offer a huge money prize and very specific mm. goals. Um, you can get people to do pretty amazing things. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's quite a few of these um, these prizes that are award, awarded to scientists um, and mathematicians as well, I should add, yeah. for these sorts of things. I mean, Nobel Prize being an obvious one. That's not for a specific goal, though. Yes. That is just for a large discovery or breakthrough. Yes, a larger contribution to the scientific world. Mm. So, um, of course, the most famous example of inducement prizes are the longitude rewards. So I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but in 714, Britain offered up to £20,000 for anyone who could determine a ship's longitude. So they'd already figured out how to determine longitude on on land, but they couldn't do it um, on the ocean. And of course, that was when, you know, that this is an area of a time of huge exploration. Mm. You know, they wanted to know where their ships were. Yep. So they offered up this prize for it. And think about it, in 1714, 20,000 pounds. So that's the most famous one, but apparently around about 100 years before that, so like 1600, Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands were all offering money for that as well. So that's how old this idea is. Yeah, wow. Centuries old. Offer money and get people and get to do it. something and it gets technologically done. awesome. And I assume it got done. It did get done because, <laughs> yes, we can now determine longer while at sea. What? Less boats running into each other and getting lost. Thank you.
Beautiful. Fantastic news from um, our friends at the ABC, mm-hmm. friends of the podcast as well, who um, who wrote a story this week about using <laughs> from the it's basically from the world of um, space lasers. Okay. Which. <laughs> <laughs> is that your favourite world? Yeah, it is my favourite world. I'm really big into space lasers. Um, so, apparently there is a company called EOS Space Systems. Yes. And they have built and developed, or are in the process of building and developing, um, some tracking systems that will track satellites and space debris that's in space. And their, their system is in Mount Stromlo, which is in Canberra. And they have basically come up with the idea of using this tracking system to follow space debris around and if it becomes a problem they shoot a space laser at it <laughs> and they they don't actually destroy this debris what it does is will actually push the debris away from the orbit of the earth or sort of into a deorbiting process. So this is what I would like to know. I would yes. like to know how many people... Because there's this thing where you just scan the headlines and you get it wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So there's so many people now who think that they're going to blow up space junk with lasers because they've read the headlines and the headlines like, shoot mm. space junk with lasers. Yep. And everyone assumes that when you shoot a laser at something, it explodes. Yes. Yes. So not quite true. Not quite so true. The, <laughs> the way that this... I mean, you, you can find this out if you read the third sentence of the article. Yes, um, which is not hard. <laughs> not too hard. Uh, I just managed it this time. So, what it actually is, is something called a photon pressure laser. And a photon pressure laser is effectively able to nudge objects in space so that they are pushed out of their orbit. The, yeah. the orbit that they were previously in. Um, and have you heard of something called a space... Oh, sorry, not a space, a um, solar sail? I have heard of it. I do not know how it works. Okay. Please inform me. Okay, so you know how light is both a wave... It's a particle and a wave. Okay. Yes. So, that means that, uh, again, this is going to be one of those, if I mess it up, then future Duncan is going to come in in the edit. Um, Because it's a particle, it actually does have some mass behind it. It has has some pushing power, okay? So, solar sails operate on the principle that light can hit an object and physically push it, okay? okay? So, that means that interstellar space travel will be possible without using traditional fuels and just by using a giant sail, okay? It's sort of like um, just a piece of material that would fold out of the spacecraft to create as big a surface area as possible and then catch as much light as they can, which eventually pushes that spacecraft out into space. And the good thing is it will just keep speeding up and speeding up as it catches more and more photons. So, yes, this space laser operates on a similar principle. If you can fire enough photons at space debris, it will nudge that object um, with the idea that it will change its orbit. So, Mm -hmm. for example, if there's a piece of space debris that's going to collide with a satellite, which would be a problem, or, say, come crashing back down to Earth, then we can just give it a quick nudge that will change its trajectory and um, hopefully no longer be a problem for us. I love this idea. I love it. I would love it more if it was real space lasers. I won't lie, but they're, the real, of... they're real space lasers. Are they not real unless they blow things up? Yeah, yeah. If we, okay. When I say real, I mean there has to be some sort of tremendous explosion. But that would just make more space junk. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> so um, the our friends at EOS Space Systems, friends of the podcast, they have actually thought of that, and they said, "Look, we can't use." real space lasers that would blow things up because then, you know, if you cut it in half, now you've got two pieces of space debris and the problem gets worse and worse. So they just give it a quick nudge and the problem goes away. So, So do you know how how bright are these space lasers? How many many photons do you have to shoot at something? Oh, it's got to be like six or ten or something. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not not sure. Um, Maybe future Duncan can chime in. An adequate explanation for now, past The number of photons is in millions of millions of trillions. But the power required by the laser is about 10 kilowatts, or about the same as a motorized scooter. Think about it. It requires less power to move something in space with little resistance than to move a car on the ground. Now, I also wanted to talk about a little something that we mentioned last episode and to give a quick update on that, which was we talked about the Tiangong-1 space station 
which was a, which is, I should say, at the time of recording, a space station um, from China that is in a collision course with Earth. And so the, the I think it's called the CNSA, Chinese National Space Agency. Yeah, good guess. Um, they lost control of it, so they they haven't been able to control it for some years, and it's yeah currently careening towards Earth, deorbiting. And um, we finally now have a date of when it will hit Earth. A probable date. A probable date. Probable. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Steph. <laughs> and that probable date is, I think, April 1st. Yep. Over Easter. Over Easter. Yeah, very exciting. So and there is a small chance that it will land in Australia. A very, 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 very small, small chance. chance that it will land in Australia. Yep. And uh, last I checked, that small chance is in Tasmania. Yeah, is, right. Does that... Yeah, right. Because yep. it was either Australia, New Zealand, possibly South America. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but there's a lot of ocean. <laughs> yeah. More than likely it'll... More than likely in the ocean. In the ocean somewhere. Apparently there's a space cemetery. What? So a lot of the stuff that's come down has been like deliberately put... In, in an area where there's obviously a lot of ocean and nothing else, because then your chances of hitting someone are mm. smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, and they called it a space cemetery. I love it. Mm. I love it. Uh, it's not in space, though, which is a bit... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> space cemetery, space lasers. Yeah. It's, it's all good stuff. Beautiful. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that update. That's a wrap on Physics Twist for this week. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Dr. Steph for sharing your love of science. Uh, don't forget that you, the listener, can meet the wonderful people of physics at your school, vacation, care, or birthday party. Just go to physicseducation.com.au. That's F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S, education.com.au. Um, also, as a little reminder, you can rate us on iTunes. It really helps us out. Um, my favourite number, just as a quick aside, is five. And we'll be back next week with another one of our educators from physics. In the meantime, if you'd like to hear some thought-provoking discussions with leading education provi- providers, you can check out the Physics Ed-, Physics Ed podcast run by Ben Newsom. Catch you next week.